Alrighty, here we go. More about reactions today. Alrighty, so yesterday we talked about, or er, Tuesday, I suppose. Last time, we talked about balancing. We talked about uh, types of reactions, predicting products. And we kind of then had one more bit, which was um, kind of quantifying components in a reaction. And that's um, what we're going to be focusing on today. Um, I do want to, though, um, show you, uh, let me pull this up. I'm going to hop over to, let's see, will this be, nope, okay, new window. So let's see if we if we go to one of ours, we should have it now, where our balancing equations is working. So I think you, you still have to click this kind of gray button. Oh, maybe you don't. Okay, you can say okay. I want it to give me twenty five problems where I'm identifying them. I wouldn't worry about predicting right now because it's probably going to include. Actually, you could do predicting and not worry about these ones. Um, make them challenging, whatever. Let's just see what we get. It'll kind of make you a little quiz and you can figure out what these are going to be. Um, although some of these like this, you probably wouldn't be able to get. It's going to behave similarly to um, a carbonate, but uh, focus on ones that, you know, we would very clearly uh, be able to uh, do. Like, for example, number nine is combustion. Uh, number eight is going to be a decomposition reaction here. You know, I haven't asked you to learn these products. Um, so maybe if you're like predicting products, don't worry about, actually, I wouldn't worry about predicting because I've given you very clear, like what to expect, like these ones, you should be able to do 22 and 23 for predicting products where I've given you, uh, some ionic compounds to make or aluminum and oxygen. Uh, so those you should be able to do. All these sorts of combustion ones, like number 16, you'll want to be able to do. Another combustion one, number 18. Um, those I want you to be able to identify the products. So it's up to you what you kind of want to talk about. Do you want to talk about, you know, identifying the type of reaction? Do you want to predict the products? Do you want to focus on balancing? Is this correct? Like, I don't know, I'm going to say H2F2 just totally not correct but let's see let's grade it let's see what we get oh no we got it all wrong so uh, we should have had this and I didn't give an answer but um, it'll give you your, your feedback so uh, definitely worth trying out you can really modify this as much as you want uh, I think there's a button here oh I don't care about cookies um, start over at the main menu i decided okay i don't want to focus on i just want to balance and i want 50 balancing problems so yeah you can have fun with this so um you know kind of work on it on your own very useful little tool here um and it's it's on canvas so on your home page i can in fact Let's look at it as if I were a student. So it's right here, balancing equations. This is the one we're going to focus on right now. Uh, we're going to see kind of these next four are going to be for next chapter, but that's not us right now. So we're just focusing on balancing equations uh, and we'll go from there. So um, it's just the fourth kind of module here on your thing. Yeah, those are labs. OK, who cares? Um, so uh, that's where we'll have that. Um, and then, oh, I haven't put the homework keys up for you guys yet. I can do that. Yikes, shame on me. Okay, well, I'll, I'll uh, deal with that later. So, um, 
that's kind of on canvas for you guys so you can use that for your practice and um you'll you'll also have your homework keys up there i'll post those so you can see all right i have one more kind of suggestion for when it comes to balancing a little um it's going to be more useful for the reactions next chapter but it's still related to balancing which i'm not going to focus on too much next chapter but we'll talk about it now so um when You've got polyatomic ions. When they're in a reaction, we're going to see that it's going to be um, easier for us to kind of keep them as one thing. And let's look at an example of that. So let's say I've got... Um, You don't need to know this type of reaction yet, but we will balance it. We will balance this thing. When you see polyatomic ions as part of a reaction, such as phosphate, as in this example, it's a lot easier to keep them as one unit. So instead of balancing phosphorus and oxygen separately, just balance it as phosphates. Uh, and that'll make things easy for us as we go through. We'll say, okay, we've got sodium, we've got phosphate, we've got calcium, we've got chlorine. And then we can, we can go through our normal task of things. We could say, okay, well, there are three sodiums on the left. We have one sodium on the right. Remember the subscripts refer to how many of that unit, unless it's part of the polyatomic ion like phosphate is. So in sodium phosphate there, the first compound, I only have one phosphate, one PO4 there. But in the calcium phosphate, I have two. Do we see that? Because remember in parentheses with the subscript means there's two of those. I have two phosphates there. I have one calcium there, and I've got three on the right. And then uh, for chlorines, it looks like I've got two and one. So if we are to balance this, we'll say, okay, well, let's look at sodium first, because why not? We'll just go top down. Usually it's fine. All right, let's go ahead and make this into three. Might as well. If we do that, we're going to change our chlorines. We now have three chlorines. Remember, every time you uh, throw a coefficient in there, you probably are changing more than one thing, so always be on the lookout. For phosphates, it looks like we're going to need two on the left. So we're going to need two there. That's going to change our sodium to six. If we want, we can now fix the sodium or we can just keep moving and come back to sodium later. I'll just fix it now, because why not? So now we need six sodiums. So we, we're not gonna actually have three here. We're gonna need a six there instead. So I won't even erase it, I'll just put it there. So we need a six there to make six sodiums. Now that's gonna actually change our chlorines to six as well, but we'll get to chlorine later. All right, so phosphorus and sodium are done. Let's go ahead and look at calcium. Calcium, we have one and three. So we're gonna need three of these. So we need three calciums there. That's gonna change our chlorines. We have two chlorines per calcium chloride. So overall, that is six. Remember, coefficient corresponds to, you multiply your coefficient by your subscript to see how many you have. So three calcium chlorides, each calcium chloride has two chlorines. Overall, therefore, that's six chlorines. The subscript for sodium and sodium phosphate is three. So we have two sodium phosphates, so that's overall six sodiums. And lo and behold, we have balanced our equation. So easier to keep polyatomic ions together. I would not separate them into phosphorus and oxygen, especially if you have um, multiple oxygen containing polyatomic ions. That's going to make your life miserable then if you try and balance them separately. So keep polyatomic ions together uh, if you see them in a reaction. 
right? Assuming they're the same on both sides. So if you've got phosphate on both sides, just keep it as phosphate. Don't bother trying to change it. So, okay. That's just one more like kind of little hint for you guys. But let's go ahead and uh, let's work with this reaction. Let's say um, how many moles Let's see, what am I making here? Salt. Okay, why not? Um, ba, 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 ba. I want 14.8 moles of salt. Something important that we discussed last time. Our reaction coefficients, once we've balanced it, that's our recipe. Once we have balanced it, that's our recipe. We just need to follow it. So we're going to get conversion factors out of this. When we're looking at these two substances, calcium chloride and sodium chloride, we have a conversion factor. We know that we're going to make 3 moles of calcium chloride to make 6 moles of sodium chloride. That's a conversion factor we get. Those are the reaction coefficients. That's our conversion factor. And so this becomes a very easy calculation, right? We say, okay, we've got 14.8 mole of sodium chloride. The abbreviation for moles, by the way, is MOL because cutting off one letter is very useful. But that's what it is. We have moles of sodium chloride. We need to cancel that out. So moles of sodium chloride goes on the bottom. That's our conversion factor. We're going to put three moles of calcium chloride on top. And we're going to end up with 7.2 moles of sodium chloride, keeping our three sig figs. Uh, that we originally started with. I'm sorry, this is calcium chloride. Rooney, what are you eating down there? Oh, you're just licking yourself. Why are you like standing? Oh, really weird. Okay, notice moles of sodium chloride cancels out. We're left with moles of calcium chloride, just a unit conversion. But how the heck do I measure that out? How do I measure out 14 or 7.2 moles of calcium chloride? Remember, we, we don't really have a device to measure moles directly because uh, the only way to do that would be to count out units of calcium chloride, you know? And we already saw that this is gonna be 10 to the 23rd, 24th power of, uh, of units there, of, of atoms. And so it's gonna be kind of very difficult to do that. So remember again, we have another conversion factor. So our reaction gives us conversion factors between different substances. And then we can go from moles of a substance to grams of a substance or vice versa, whatever substance A happens to be. Uh, that's the molar mass, right? That's the, the conversion between moles and grams is the molar mass. So let's say now I want 50 grams of sodium chloride. How many grams How many grams of calcium chloride am I going to need? 7.4, do I not? Oh, yeah. Obviously, 8 divided by 2 is 4. Yes, very good. Don't forget, you still need the 0, though. So, while, yes, your math is better than mine, don't forget the 0 for sig figs. We had 3 sig figs to begin with. And 3 sig figs to end with. So, yes. Always check my, my math. I appreciate it, because... Uh, 
I don't want someone coming in later and be like, hey, wait a second, this is wrong. Uh, yeah. It's what I get for trying to do things in my head. Oh, well. Cool. All right. Looking at this one. I'm using the same substances because we already have our our conversion. But now, so we're starting at grams of sodium chloride. We want grams of calcium chloride. That's what we're trying to figure out. We can never go directly from grams to grams of different substances. If we need to change our substance, sodium chloride to calcium chloride, different chemical compounds, we have to go through moles. That's the only way to do it through a reaction. And so we're going to see here our plan uh, is going to look like this. We're going to start with our grams of sodium chloride, the number that was given to us in this problem, 50 grams. We're going to need to convert that to moles of sodium chloride using the molar mass of sodium chloride. We're then going to go from moles of sodium chloride to moles of calcium chloride. That's using our reaction coefficients. And then from moles of calcium chloride to grams of calcium chloride, that is a different molar mass. And so we just need to kind of figure out our conversion factors, and then we can throw it all, throw it all out doing our, our actual conversion. So let's see it. Let's see, what's the molar mass of sodium chloride? Thankfully, that's just sodium plus chlorine, which is 22.99. Don't need parentheses anymore. Plus 35.45. These numbers are from the periodic table. Your periodic table may give you slightly different numbers. Use whatever periodic table you like. Um, I do recommend one that has at least two decimal points, though. I'm going to give you more accurate answers. If you add these up, what are we going to get? 58.44. Yeah. The unit for this is grams per mole, or AMU. AMU and grams per mole are the same unit. We're not really going to ever use AMU, so just use grams per mole. Our reaction coefficients we've already got because we balance our equation. We need a second molar mass now for our problem. So we've got one calcium and two chlorines. Calcium is about 40.08 plus 2 times 35.45. Again, those numbers from the periodic table. 70.9 plus 40 is 110.98. We'll find out. Okay. Um, grams per mole. Honestly, 111 is probably just fine. But uh, whatever. Close enough. So those are our conversion factors then. So remember, grams per mole means, just to make it super obvious for us, 58.44 grams equals one mole. That's what this conversion is. Remember, we could just say one on the bottom. Typically just don't, but that's the, uh, the thing. And remember, we can flip these over as we need to. Because right, they're equal to each other. 58.44 grams is equal to one mole of sodium chloride. So let's go ahead and do it out. So we're starting with our number we have, 50 grams. I always like to include my substance so I don't get confused. We need something to cancel grams of sodium chloride. Um, remember, we said we wanted to get moles of sodium chloride, so we're going to do it that way. And we're going to put our 58.44 grams there. Then, that's our first one. Our second conversion factor was the reaction coefficients. 
moles of sodium chloride goes on the bottom to cancel out. And I think that was six and three for our moles of calcium chloride, because that's what we want. That's the substance we want. And now we are going to uh, see that we're going to cancel out moles of calcium chloride. And we're going to get 110.98 here. And doing all this stuff, let's make sure our units have canceled out. Grams of sodium chloride cancels. Moles of sodium chloride cancels. Moles of calcium chloride cancels. We're ending up with grams of calcium chloride. We just got to do all this math now. Where's my calculator? Okay, to the Google it is. 50 divided by 58.44 divided by 2 times 110.98. We get 47 point 47 <laughs> grams calcium chloride. And again, we are going to want to round our number based on the sig figs we have. We had three sig figs to start with our 50 grams. So we're going to want to go ahead and use 47.5 grams of calcium chloride to make that. All right, so that's how much uh, mass of calcium chloride we're going to need to make that many grams of sodium chloride. All right, that's the process. It'll look very similar for any other problem. As I spill coffee all over myself. At least it's kind of cooler now. It wasn't as hot as it was this morning, so I didn't burn myself. That's good. But uh, it's not too bad, right? The only thing that we're throwing in new here, I guess all three of them are new, never mind. But it's still unit conversion. That's all we're doing. You thought we were done. I'm telling you, we're never done with unit conversion. It is a process we will keep doing. Alrighty. How about we do another one? Any questions on this one, by the way? Or the last one, or whatever? Alrighty. Another one, then. Do, 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 do. Let's see, what shall we do this time? All right, what mass in grams of magnesium carbonate is needed to produce what's our favorite number <laughs> how about 82.62 grams of carbon dioxide part b what mass so first question part a what mass of magnesium carbonate do i need to make this amount of carbon dioxide and part b how much magnesium oxide do i end up with two questions we'll do one at a time if we're going from grams of carbon dioxide to grams of magnesium carbonate, we're going to see it's much the same process as we just did. Thankfully, this reaction is already balanced for us. I'm so generous. I understand. Um, we're going from grams of carbon dioxide to moles of carbon dioxide to moles of magnesium carbonate two grams of magnesium carbonate. Ta-da! Our unit plan is identical. We've switched out some things. But our unit plan is the same. 
In fact, our conversion factors will be the same. We'll just have different numbers. We're still going to need a molar mass, molar ratios from reaction coefficients, and then molar mass again. So it's not too bad. Not too bad, right? Same thing. I'm going to go ahead and cheat for us. The molar mass of carbon dioxide is 44.01 grams per mole. And for magnesium carbonate, and I'm going to give you magnesium oxide also. I'm going to cheat. I'm going to look them up. Magnesium carbonate. Okay. All right, what do we got here? The uh, molar mass of magnesium carbonate is 84.31. 84 and magnesium oxide is going to be 40.30. Okay. Those are all of the molar masses we need. We don't need to worry about calculating them. Um, Though you might need to, but that's another problem. Okay, so um, with this, let's go ahead and see what we can do. So uh, we're starting with grams of, of carbon dioxide, 82.62 grams CO2. First conversion factor is grams to moles, so we're going to need our molar mass, 44.01 grams one mole. Next conversion factor again, so here I'll write them out. Next one is our reaction coefficients and then we back to our molar mass. Our reaction coefficients are all one for this. We have already one magnesium, three oxygens, and two and one carbon on each side, so we're already balanced. I would still always write this out, even though they're just one. I would always write them all out, even if they're just one. It's very good practice to do that. And uh, then we have our molar mass of the magnesium carbonate that we're looking for. And so we're going to get our answer. So let's do it. Okay, here we go. 82.62 divided by 44.01 times 84.31. We're going to end up getting 158.27 grams. If we need to round that, we'll say 158.3 grams. Four sig figs like we started with. So if we want to make that many grams of carbon dioxide, we're going to need to react that much magnesium carbonate. All right, so how's that? Hopefully not too bad. Don't click that link, please. We're being spammed by Ziggy Ba zero zero two six nine six. Don't click that. In fact, I don't even think it's a real link, but my spam filter is not picking it up. But don't click that. Don't go there. Here. There. We'll yell at them. So um, that's how we will do this. This process is called stoichiometry, by the way. Well, I'll write that word later because we still have part of this problem to go. We're also asked how much magnesium oxide is also made. And it's, in fact, going to be the same setup. Now with this one, we have options. We could start with the CO2 and go to magnesium oxide, or we could start with the magnesium carbonate. Uh, 
We have two options here. We can use either of them. I'll tell you that one of them is better than the other. The first one is better. Just in case we made a mistake with magnesium carbonate, we should probably avoid using that number just in case. Maybe there's rounding errors, maybe we accidentally put something in the calculator wrong. It's better to use numbers you're absolutely sure of. We know we have 82.62 grams of carbon dioxide that's given in the problem. So that number is safe. Absolutely 100% sure and safe. This magnesium carbonate, maybe we're only 99.99% safe. So just better, I would use this one. This will be the better option for our plan our unit plan here. All right, so let's do it. Let's go ahead and work this out. So 82.62 grams CO2, 44.01 grams CO2, one mole CO2. So it starts exactly the same. We're now going to instead have one mole magnesium oxide, one mole CO2, and now we have a different mass here, 40.30, uh, one mole MgO, and we'll get our answer. Ba -ba 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 -ba. 82, oops. 0.62 divided by 44.01 times 40.3. We get 75.66 grams magnesium oxide. So we found that if we wanted this 82.62 grams of carbon dioxide, we would need to react 158.3 grams of magnesium carbonate and we would get out 75.66 grams of magnesium oxide. Anyone notice anything about these numbers? That works for this problem. Perhaps you might notice it, but one fifty eight point twenty eight is what we would get by adding this up. Notice that we calculated one fifty eight point twenty seven. These add up to the same thing. And that should be the case because our reaction has three components, right? I'll be consistent, 75.66. Notice they all, uh, so if you have every component in a reaction, if you've calculated everything in your reaction, yes, it will. You can check your work this way, yes. Because remember, matter cannot be created or destroyed. So if you start with 158 grams, you better end with 158 grams, right? Conservation of matter, conservation of mass. Uh, you can't just lose mass randomly. So when you do this reaction, you're gonna lose 82.62 grams of carbon dioxide. It's just gonna float away, right? It's a gas. Uh, and you're gonna be left with 75.66 grams of magnesium oxide. This works if you have everything in your um, reaction. So if your reaction has 10 different components, if you've got six reactants and four products, 
it'll be harder to do this, right? Because then you'd have to calculate every single one and it could be a little time consuming. But something simple like this, got one reactant, two products, certainly could. And in fact, we didn't even need to do the stoichiometry process for the magnesium oxide. We could have just taken our magnesium carbonate number, subtracted the CO2, and we would end up with magnesium oxide. So you can kind of cheat that way. It's not cheating. It's using chemistry to your advantage. Um, but yeah, you, you can check your work with it, or you can kind of do a shortcut if you have all your products. Let's look at this one. Um, ba, 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 ba. If we take that first one we did, we had what? The um, sodium phosphate plus calcium chloride. Calcium phosphate plus sodium chloride. If you have like 100 grams and 50 grams or something, I'm making these numbers up. Don't trust the numbers, but whatever they are. Um, you can't just say, oh, well, this is going to be 50 grams. Uh, I guess we would need another zero there. But anyways, you can't just say that. Right, because we have another reactant that we're putting in. So it's, if you really want, you can only check the entire mass of your reactants against the entire mass of your products. So it gets a little bit more tricky when you have um, more compounds. So this can't be 50, can't be 50 there. Because we have to put some amount of calcium chloride in there, right? And so, um, but if we know, if we put another 100 grams in, then, okay, now I can say this should be 150 grams. That you can say. Once you have all the pieces, then you can make these connections. But if you're missing more than one piece, you can't use it. So you're going to have to use the stoichiometry otherwise. Okay, so... I'm going to erase these numbers. Actually, I'm going to erase this whole like equation bit because I just don't want people to get confused, but um, that's the case. So the basically, if we want to write this out, some of your reactant mass will e always equal the sum of your product mass. Remember, sigma means sum. So you just add up all your the mass of your reactants, add up the mass of your products, they should be equal. And so sometimes with simple things, you can use that to your advantage to save a little bit of time. Um, but just be aware, stoichiometry will also never, get, never lead you astray. Stoichiometry will always work. Um, it just takes a little bit more time. Here's that word, by the way. That's the word of the day. That's this process by using the idea of moles to convert between different substances. That's stoichiometry. And that's what we're doing with this. All right. Okay. Let's take a moment to process. And we can um, do... something a little bit more realistic. There's two things that uh, can mess with our stoichiometry. One of them is just kind of realistic limits. <clears throat> We're going to see that Sometimes we are going to run out of one reactant before all of the other reactant can can get to work. For example,
Here's their reaction for us. Let's say. I'm going to put 50 grams of each of these in here. And I want to see. Am I going to get. 100 grams of products? We'll see. We're going to see, in fact, that we have to balance this, by the way. Hold up. Let me just balance it real quick. Ta da! Okay. Um, with something like this, And this is the more kind of the case of it. We're gonna see it's it's kind of akin to to cooking, right? Let's say you're making pound cake, pound of eggs, pound of flour, pound of butter, pound of sugar. If you have five hundred pounds of flour, sugar, and eggs, but only three pounds of butter, you're only gonna be able to make three pound cakes. It doesn't matter how much more sugar you have. Because once you run out of one reactant, your butter, you're done. No more products are being made. And so you're going to be and left. You're going to be given leftovers of all some of your reactants. But the butter is going to limit how much product you can make. And so we're going to see it's going to be the same case in chemical reactions. If we just put things together, chances are unless we've planned it out perfectly, something is going to run out first. And that will dictate how much product we can make. So one of these reactants, the silver or the nitric acid, is going to be our butter, essentially. We're going to run out of it, and then we can't react anymore. And the, the idea of this is that um, kind of often one reactant will limit the amount of product you can make. And we will call that the limiting reactant. So, with this, we can see which one of these is going to work out, run out first. And to do this, we're essentially going to do this process of stoichiometry using each of our reactants, making the same product. We can choose which product we're, we're going to focus on. Let's, let's talk about the hydrogen gas, H2. It'll be easy because it's a, such an easy molecule, the molar mass is easy for that. Let's see what would happen. Let's see how much H2 we can make with that 50 grams of silver. If we want to do that, process is the same. We could even stop at moles, but let's just do the whole thing, because why, why bother? We're going to want to do this one to see how much H2 we can make out of that silver, that 50 grams. And we're going to do the same thing with our nitric acid. We're going to see, okay, well, how much H2 can I make with 50 grams of nitric acid? We're going to see which of one of these is going to run out first. And, I mean, you might be saying, but they're both 50 grams. Remember, we can never use grams directly to make any sort of inference like this. We need to use moles. Moles are the only answer ever <laughs> in chemistry. So moles are our are, are friends. So let's go ahead and work with silver. Let's get some molar masses out here. Uh, so we have them, the molar mass of silver. This is one I don't know off the top of my head. 107, 109, somewhere around there. Let's find out. 107.9. <laughs> go figure. Okay. 
I knew I had it somewhere in my head, but not quite solid. So that's silver of, uh, let's see, nitric acid. Let's see, 14 plus 48 is 62.63.02, we'll say. And then the molar mass of hydrogen is 2.016. I've added up the uh, elements there. Check by math, please. But um, well, silver, there's no math required because it's just one atom, one element. 14 plus 48, 62. Yeah, that should be right. Okay, anyways, assuming these numbers are correct, we can use them. Let's do it. 50 grams of silver times 107.9 grams of silver for every mole of silver. What is our coefficients? Two and one. Two moles of silver. That's the coefficient of silver in our reaction. One mole of H2. That's the coefficient for H2. And 2.016 grams, one mole. Let's do it. 50 divided by 107.9. Whoops, I somehow messed that up. 50 divided by 107.9 divided by 2 times 2.016 is 0. Point. Did I type that wrong? No, no this makes sense. Um, we're going to make 0. 0.467 grams of H2. Should be a small number, that makes sense, yeah. Very small molar mass here. Most of the, the weight is gonna go into the silver nitrate. All right, let's go ahead and do the same thing for the nitric acid. So using its molar mass, we'll convert to grams. I'm sorry, to moles. Conversion factor from the reaction, our coefficients. And then finally, the molar mass of hydrogen will give us our answer. Let's go ahead and calculate it. So, 63.02. We get this, we get 0 0.7997, which will round to 0 0.800 grams H2. So now what do we do? So, these numbers tell us how much we can make with that amount of reactant. 50 grams of silver, if we react that, all of it, we get 0.467 grams of hydrogen out. If we react 50 grams of nitric acid, we'll end up with 0.8 grams of hydrogen. So, just like our cakes were limited to making three cakes, even though we had enough sugar to make 500 cakes, we ran out of butter first. So we are limited to three cakes. We always choose the smallest number. So we are going to only make that much hydrogen out of this. That's going to be how much hydrogen we can make. We're going to therefore say that silver is the limiting reactant. The silver is our butter in this case.
all right? So silver limits how much hydrogen we can make. It is our limiting reactant. That will be as much as we can't make. We can't make any more because we'll run out of silver. Once we run out of silver, there's no more reaction. All right. One more thing we can do. Um, one more thing we can do is figure out how much nitric acid we have left over. We know since silver is limiting, silver, silver will run out. And as a result, we're going to have some excess nitric acid will remain at the end. We're still going to have some extra nitric acid floating around in there. And we can figure that out. We can figure out how much. How that works is, we can put it in a handy dandy formula, we can say the kind of amount, the starting amount, minus, how do I want to phrase this? We actually have to kind of do like, uh, okay, it's the starting amount minus the starting amount multiplied by the kind of oh gosh I don't know how to put this in words um, this is going to be in this case it'll be kind of the um, the numbers here would be 0.800 and 0.467 um this is the amount of product from the limiting reactant over the amount of product from your excess reactant, if that makes sense. This will be easier when we see it in math. So that would be 50 grams minus 50 grams times 0 0.467 grams over 0 0.800 grams and whatever number that happens to be that's how much we'd have left um here let's do it and i'll, I'll try and <laughs> figure out some way to make that a little bit easier so 50 minus 50 times 0.467 divided by 0.8 you're going to end up with about 20.81 grams, sorry, 8 grams left over. So we're going to use, most of it will have about 20 grams left over. So uh, that's how we can find out how much will remain. So we can call the um, this the excess reactant. That's ER. Limiting reactant is LR. So that's what those numbers mean. So the amount of product we get from the limiting reactant divided by the amount that we would make from the excess reactant, uh, we can essentially do um, the amount we started with minus that product times our amount we started with. So uh, we would see that we would end up with 20.8 grams left over. So we won't have used it all up. This number here, if you were to just calculate it by itself, it 
would be the amount that we had actually used up. So we will have used up apparently, what, 29.2 grams of this uh, nitric acid. And so we have 20.8 left over. So we've used up 29 grams. We have 20.8 gift uh, at the end of the reaction. So we've used up our 50 grams of silver. We've used 29.2 grams of our nitric acid. And so we haven't used the entire 100 grams that we put in. We still have some leftover reactant. All right. The process for this is exactly the same as stoichiometry. You just do it twice. You do it once for each reactant. And kind of how you know there's a limiting reactant. You know that when you are given amounts of each reactant. If you're given, say, we have 50 grams of silver and excess nitric acid, you don't have a limiting reactant, right? Your silver is going to be, it's going to complete, or you know silver is your limiting reactant. So you don't have to do this calculation twice. If one of them says it's excess already, you don't need to do this. But if you're given two masses or two quantities, two moles, whatever it is, of your reactants, you're going to have to do stoichiometry separately for each reactant. So you have to take the mass of your first reactant, figure out how much product you make, take now the second mass for your second reactant, figure out how much product you make, and choose the lower number. That is what's called your theoretical yield. By the way, that's another vocabulary term. For this one, this number here, Sorry, I have so little space. This one is called your theoretical yield. And that is how much product can possibly be made no, I don't know how to spell can possibly be made from your limiting reactant. So in this case, our theoretical yield was 0.457 grams or whatever it was. And so that's uh, kind of more vocabulary here. So you have to do this limiting reactant idea, do your stoichiometry for all your reactants. If you're given exact numbers of those reactants. If you're given the word excess or told this one is your limiting reactant, then you only have to work with that one. It's not a problem. But if you're given information about each reactant, you have to do this process for all of them. And so it's uh, just something to, to keep in mind. All right, and you'll get one theoretical yield that's always the smallest number of, in this case, we had two reactants. One gave us 0.8, one gave us 0.467. The smaller number is your theoretical yield, 0.467. If we had a third reactant, we'd compare all three numbers. We only have two reactants, so we compare two numbers. So that's uh, what we need to do with this. All right. How's that? Do we need to take a moment to breathe, perhaps? There's just one more bit to include with this. One more bit to do. And that's going to be what's called the yield of a reaction. The yield of a reaction 
we're going to see in reality other things happen. Maybe you have a side reaction that consumes some of your reactant. Maybe you have a spill. <laughs> You're careless and you spilled some of your nitric acid that you were going to react. I guess that was in our limiting reactant. Anyway, fine, but you, you, you stole some of the silver. <laughs> and uh, so as a result, you don't get as much as you think you will. The theoretical yield is the maximum you could possibly make if everything works perfectly and there's no side reactions and no spills and no anything gone wrong which never happens, we're going to see that we have a, a, a number that we call the, uh, the percent yield of a reaction. And uh, it, it's more important for this for organic chemistry than it is for general chemistry, but we still talk about it here because it's, it's important. We're going to see that that's just your actual yield, however much you in reality made, so theoretically, we could make 0.457 grams of hydrogen, but maybe we've only really made 0.4 because some of it had done something else or whatever. Some other thing had happened to some of our silver. Um, your actual yield is a number you would be given or you would calculate it by giving a percent yield. So it's your actual over your theoretical times 100%. So let's go back to this problem and say, okay, I only isolated 0 0.4 grams of H2 from the reaction. That number there is an actual yield. So something that happened in reality. You say, oh yes, I could make 0.467 grams of hydrogen gas, but due to X, Y, Z, I only got 0.4 grams. Your actual yield is always less than your theoretical yield. Than the theoretical yield. And so we can see what our percent yield for this reaction was. So for this reaction, for these given numbers, let me just make sure I have the right number here, 0.467, okay. I think half the time I'm saying 0.457. I do notice that, by the way. I, I'm, I understand I misspeak sometimes, but yeah. So our actual yield, the number that we got in reality, noted some way, like in this sentence, that I got 4.4 grams. And our theoretical yield we calculate from the stoichiometry, right? And since it's a percent, we can go ahead and throw a 100% here. And let's do it. 0.4 divided by 0.467. We got 85.7% yield. So we might say this reaction worked 85.7% efficiently. 85.7% effectively, whatever it may be. And oftentimes, at least in organic chemistry, you always report your yield because in OCHEM, when you get there, you'll see that there are so many side reactions that happened, that happen. With Gen Chem, there aren't a lot. Not a lot of things react in Gen Chem. But in OCHEM, it's always like, well, I know 90% of the time it'll react this way. 
but just as things happen to collide and react, they could form other products. And with organic chemistry, we have millions of different organic compounds. With gen chem, we're, we're dealing with hundreds only. So we don't really have that many side products that we can make. But in ochem, there are millions of them. And so we always lose something in your reaction. Something else happens to your molecule and you end up lowering your yield. In gen chem often, that's just because maybe, um, I don't want to get into equilibrium chemistry, but sometimes your reaction runs in reverse. So some of it will actually decompose back into your reactants. And so there's always reasons that your, your yield is never what the actual one is, but we'll see. Good news is, once you know the yield of a reaction, say you've done a reaction several times and you're always getting 86% yield, you can use that to predict. You're going to say, okay, well, I understand I'm going to lose kind of 14% of my product to whatever side reactions or whatever is happening. And so you can plan for that. You can say, well, I'm going to actually now add extra reactants so I can actually still make the amount I want. And I know I'm going to not make as much as I could. And we're going to see what that looks like. We'll see. We'll see. <clears throat> All right, here's how something like this might look. I want to actually make 100 grams of, what shall we make? Ammonia. I know the reaction is 72.4% effective. How much H2 in grams do I need to actually make 100 grams of ammonia, assuming excess nitrogen. Here's our reaction. We've done this before. So I've told us in this problem, excess nitrogen. That means hydrogen is going to be our limiting reactant, which makes it easy. We only have to worry about one calculation then. <clears throat> so, let's see what we can do with these numbers. <clears throat> I want an actual yield of 100 grams. So, my theoretical yield is going to be something bigger than that, right? What I want to be able to make has to be higher than what I'm actually going to make. And so, we can use this idea of a percent yield. We can say, okay, well, 72.4% is going to be our actual yield over our theoretical yield, not TR, TY, our theoretical yield in grams. We can solve for this. Let me just say X. I don't like this TY business, X grams. Solve it. X equals 100 over 0 0.724. <clears throat> and so, um, if we do that, 100 divided by 0.724 means our theoretical yield needs to be 0.724. I'm not going to run this quite yet. But that's what our theoretical yield is going to be need to be. That's our theoretical yield. So now we can say, okay, well, I know how many grams of ammonia I should plan to make in order to actually get 100 grams. So let's go ahead and do that. So 138, or I'm sorry, we should plan this out. We have the grams of ammonia we want, which is the 138. That's what we're planning to make. So we end up with 100. 
just like before. Stoichiometry. Here we go, let's do it. 138.122. Oops. Again, I've just not rounded this number because I don't want to introduce error in, so I'm leaving a few extra sig figs on there. But I know I should have four sig figs for our answer. That's why I've underlined the fourth one. Molar mass, 17.03. Four, I think. Times, we had two moles of ammonia, three moles hydrogen. Those two numbers coming from our reaction here, those are our coefficients, three and two. Again, I'm zipping through the molar mass because I don't want to use time just adding nitrogen plus three hydrogens. You can do that, double check me, make sure I'm right on that. Hydrogen, we already know, 2.016. Oh my gosh. All that, let's do it. 138.122 divided by 17.034 times 3 over 2 times 2.016 tells us we need to put in, oops, ah, 24.52 grams of hydrogen. So we already know only 75% of this business will react. 72 or whatever it was. So we need to plan to make a little bit of extra in order to make sure that we are going to make the amount we actually want. And so that's how we would do this. So it's just adding one more step essentially to the process. And so we're going to need that much hydrogen to react with excess nitrogen at an efficiency of 72% to get us our 100 grams of ammonia. And so that's the utility of this. We can plan for things to go wrong so that we are still making the amount we really want. All right. <laughs> Lots of information today. I have one more thing to throw at you. Just one. That thing is called percent composition. I realized, remember, I'm having you watch the empirical formula video for the other class. I need to teach you the opposite process. So empirical formula takes us from percent of a certain element to figuring out a formula for your, your compound. We can do the, the opposite process. We can take a compound and see how much of each element there is in it. And it's really quite simple. Any questions, by the way, on this yield and reaction and stoichiometry and all that business? I understand there's a lot here, a lot of math. This is going to take a lot of processing. The process is the same, though. We can see going from grams to grams, three steps, grams to moles, moles to moles, moles to grams. Very straightforward, I suppose. Alrighty, so last thing here, just kind of as an aside. I usually use sodium for this example, because it's useful. If we want to sign the percent of an element in a compound, It's just the molar mass of your element or the molar mass of your compound. Now 
times 100%. Often case, I use sodium because you are you have some healthcare implications with sodium, right? We want, or rather, there are a lot of people are on sodium restrictive diets, right? Uh, and so uh, it's important that you know, okay, well, sodium chloride is how we get most of our salt, our sodium. And so by knowing how much, what percent of sodium chloride the sodium is, we can say, okay, well, if I need to limit myself to two grams of sodium per day, how much sodium chloride can I have? This comes down to this percent composition idea. Let's take a look at for sodium chloride. The percent of sodium chloride in sodium, sodium in sodium chloride would be the atomic mass of sodium, molar mass of sodium, over the mass of sodium plus chlorine. It's 35.45 times 100. It's about 40%, if I remember correctly. This number tells us that sodium chloride is 40% sodium by mass. So we can say, okay, well, Patient can only have 1.5 grams of sodium today. So this patient can only have 1.5 grams of sodium per day, but she has sodium chloride. How the heck is she going to know the sodium? Well, she can use this percent idea. She can say, okay, well, I know that sodium chloride is 40% sodium. It's really the, the kind of same idea. We can say, okay, well, that 40% of my sodium. For this purpose, we use the, the molar masses, but we can use real masses too. We can say, okay, well, I can have one point five grams of sodium. We can figure out how much sodium chloride that's going to be. And if you do the math, 1.5 grams divided by 0 0.4, again, times 100%. I often just keep percents as decimals. That's just how I work, I guess. What's that number going to be? Can I do this in my head? Times 5 divided by 2, 3.75. See how crazy I am. 1.5 divided by 0.4. Oh, I did it. 3.75, yeah. So, patient can have, therefore, that much sodium chloride, how much salt they can weigh out, she can weigh out, in order to make sure she doesn't go over her 1.5 grams of sodium per day. So, useful thing. Easy to calculate, easy to use. You can also do it for random elements. We could say what percent we can do it for any element in any compound. I mean, there's not really a purpose to doing this, but that's never stopped an educator, right? We love to do problems that don't have a purpose. The sodium one, yeah, useful. You can use that in real life. This one, perhaps less so. But we'll see that the percent of oxygen will be 16. Notice we have six oxygens. So the molar mass of all those oxygens would be 16 times 6. I'll write that out.
over carbon plus 12 hydrogens plus 6 oxygens, which would be what, 96 divided by 180.2, I believe that's about right, and so times 200, fine, I'll put that there, it's a percentage, fine. So the simple thing to do, 96 divided by 180.2. I do a lot of mental math, so again, please check me, but this seems pretty reasonable. 53.27%. Hooray. Again, we don't have to really worry about sig figs here because these aren't measured things. These are like kind of... The atomic mass will depend on the um, mass you get from your periodic table. And yeah, so that's how you find percent of a particular element in a compound. Empirical formula does the opposite. You go from percents to figuring out formulas. So again, watch that video uh, from Tuesday that I did with the 101 students. So interestingly enough, still they're learning essentially the same things, but we're not doing it in the context of reactions there. Uh, you know, we, we talk about moles and all that, but it's really just to talk about describing compounds and elements or you guys are talking about reactions instead, so, um, yeah. Alrighty, what an amount of work this has been, but there it is. I bet I'm going to get a swarm of questions on Sunday, so we'll see if I'm available. <laughs> I can't guarantee it, but uh, I'll try to be around on Sunday if y'all got questions. Um, you do have your first exam on Monday. I have to write it. I have a placeholder right now, but I'm going to write it. Um, I can give you some information about that. We can say it's probably going to be, da, 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 let's see, how many questions shall I give? Maybe about 30 questions or so. from all over stuff we've done. So nomenclature, stoichiometry, sig figs, balancing equation, talking about protons and neutrons, matter, all sorts of things that we've talked about so far. You'll have about 75 minutes. So it's on Canvas. It'll be open from You'll have somewhere in this window to take your exam. So midnight to midnight, you have 24 hours to take it. Set aside 75 minutes. That's an hour and 15 minutes. Uh, that's probably what we're going for. It's about 30 questions. It's multiple choice. So um, you'll work through those. Um, it'll be on Canvas. So you'll just go onto Canvas and it'll be there. It'll be a quiz essentially. So you'll click like start quiz or whatever, and it'll start your timer. And then you'll have all those questions to work on. And so you'll go through those. All right, so we our first one. The rest will be essentially the same kind of pattern. And we'll go from there. So if questions come up, put them on Discord. We'll go over them. Um, and yeah, we'll go from there. So. First exam is generally the easiest one, but I understand this stoichiometry stuff is, is somewhat new. So that's all right. It's, uh, I understand that. So you do have homework that's due on Sunday or Monday, the 19th. I think it's due, it's due Sunday at, at 11.59. The answer key will become available. I'm gonna make your answer keys available right now for the old other homeworks. Um, let me, let me make those available. So we did, what, unit conversions? Ugh, I have to make a new module, are you kidding me? Okay, I'll make that available in just a second. Um, 
Excuse me. <coughs> Dilman Creature Homework is due tonight. So I'll try and get that key up for you as well. Um, those will be on the Canvas front page. And uh, then you'll have some... Uh, your like moles homework is going to be due on Sunday. You'll be able to view the answer key on Monday. So if you want to do that before taking your exam, I do suggest that. Um, because why not? It's, it's just helpful for you to make sure that you're getting everything right. And then you can ask questions if uh, things come up. All right. Coolio. Looks like we're good. So um, best of luck. It's on Monday. I will put, probably see you again on Tuesday. So uh, unless you get scared away. But I hope not. Okay. That's that then. Enjoy your weekend. Study well. And, uh, and, and enjoy your homework. So, alrighty. Take care, everyone.